Good evening, everyone. Uh, good evening, uh, fellow Ontarians. This is uh, Kelly Brown here with you. Uh, it's the first time I've jumped on in a video uh, like this. Um, it is uh, February 11th. Um, and I uh, wanted to jump on today and talk about the Ontario Science Table modeling presentation that was given just a few hours ago. And I, um, I may do a, a series of videos talking about various COVID-19 uh, related uh, data and issues as I see them. I'd hope to do maybe more of an intro video, uh, but um, given the modeling presentation that uh, we saw today, I thought I wanted to get jump on and just give a, an overview of what I see. So I'm going to um, do a share screen where I take you through some of the slides that were presented today and, um, and some of the data and talk through it as I see it. Uh, basically, what we saw was um, a continued advocation for stay at home orders to be kept in place uh, by the science table um, because of the threat of new variants, uh, even despite declining positivity cases, hospitalizations, ICUs and deaths, they acknowledge that. Uh, but acknowledge that the cases aren't down far enough. The quote, our number is not down far enough uh, before we can lift public health measures because of the pending threat of, um, of the variants. So I wanna critique this a little bit and um, it won't take too long. Uh, this will be a short video, uh, but let's, uh, let's just go through it. Um, I'm gonna share my screen here. Uh, so just follow along. Um, just a moment. Okay, so here we have the uh, the presentation that was given today, February 11th, and we'll just go through it. Um, so starting right off, the first point that was made uh, here, which, you know, I think is really and truly up for debate, and they did not make a good argument, is just this first one that says public health measures are paying off in declining mobility cases, positivity, and hospitalizations. And the reason that was given for this, really, in my view, the only reason was given on this second slide as proof is the declines in mobility have helped reduce cases. And what they're showing here, this is a graph of the fall and the overall level of mobility, um, the, the sharp decline everywhere during the holidays and then coming out of the holidays, Ontario, given the stay at home order, uh, was still very low. And that was directly attributed to the success uh, that we've had on cases and positivity. So I just want to challenge that for a moment um, because you see here that we're looking at uh, provincially, there's been a, there's a wide range of mobility trends, uh, Ontario being the most strict uh, uh, or adherent, uh, we could say, and say Alberta, British Columbia, Manitoba being the least. So how did those provinces do uh, given their the higher levels of mobility? And I know it's not a perfect comparison, but if you look across every province, British Columbia, Alberta, Manitoba, Ontario, uh, and, and some of the other ones, uh, Quebec, they've all experienced these precipitous declines despite the uh, differing levels of, of mobility trends. So if, even if you were to accept that this, that, that, or even if these showed more consistent uh, across province, a consistent mobility across province, they're still only correlating the decline in mo mobility with declining cases. There's, to me, there's no evidence that one is actually causing the other. There's, there's no evidence actually presented. So I just wanted to touch on that. And so let's just go back up to, and, and, and sorry, before I leave that, uh, one of the, the one thing that was not mentioned that I heard uh, mentioned once was the word seasonality. So I just wanna, some of you may have seen this. I, uh, I posted this item on, um, on Twitter uh, the other night uh, which is essentially a very basic graph of uh, past coronavirus seasonality. So this is the last five or six flu se um, 
respiratory virus seasons, and I've selected coronaviruses. Uh, and you can see on the left here is the percent positivity. Uh, and we sort of have this, you know, seasonal peak every year, uh, somewhere between eight and 12. Sometimes it goes a little higher, but, you know, pretty much 10% every year is the seasonal peak. And it happens right around Christmas. You see that every single year. And I just, you know, want to plot that. Uh, so these are the old coronaviruses, the common cold, the ones that would circulate the H cov viruses that would circulate before SARS-CoV-2. And then I'm showing SARS-CoV-2 here as the predominant coronavirus because H cov viruses were, were essentially gone. Um, and so there's many ways that this can be interpreted and I am not to be clear saying that, that the declines are only due to seasonality, but to me, this is something that needs to be explored. And I just don't know why the science table uh, is not even uttering the word seasonality here as a reason why uh, cases in Ontario here have, have, have seemed to have peaked. So that's the first issue. So let's come back up. I want to, uh, so um, there was some talk here about the uh, focus on long-term care uh, homes paying off with declining daily deaths. And that's a great news story uh, talking about how, um, you know, and, and so to, to, to show the impact of vaccinations and protecting that group, they show this chart, this slide here, which is slide eight. And you can see the red, this, this is a, a, a daily or weekly COVID deaths. And they show it by age cohort, as well as long-term care deaths. And you can see you know, as we all know that uh, the first and second wave, the, the majority of the deaths were, were in long-term care facilities, sadly. The, the rest of the community is this darker line here, which is you know, still very sad, but it is just not the same type of out of control uh, growth that we see if we just look at the whole chart. So this is a good news story. Uh, and if you wanna look, uh, uh, more closely, um, you know, the point is made that, like, let's look at, let's take both LTC, the red bar, and let's take this black bar, and that represents um, the population over 80 and LTC, and the great majority of those deaths, I mean, that looks like above 75% of all deaths, sadly, is in that cohort, and the rest of community mortality under the age of 79 really is, I mean, every, every death is tragic, but I mean, if you just look at the, the shape of that curve, that is, I mean, to me, I'm not a scientist, but that, that to me does not look like an epidemic curve. Um, the, the, real, the real risk here is in LTC and, and in 80 plus. But the reason why I bring this up today is because what was discussed was that, well, even though the long-term care is the you know, biggest uh, contributor to, to deaths and, and, and folks over 80, they still don't contribute to, I'm gonna change the slide here. They, they don't contribute to the majority of ICU admissions. So again, this is a chart of, of weekly COVID-19 ICU admissions. And we see in red here, uh, the LTC is a much smaller proportion than, than it was deaths. And, you know, the argument being, you know, we're still not out of the, even though we vaccinated um, um, much of the long-term care residents, much of the, the elderly people at risk, it's not really going to put a dent in the overall ICU admissions. And I suppose that's, that's true if you just count the, the red bar here. Uh, I, and the 80 plus bar. However, uh, if you just come down to the ages of 60, which still represents a fairly small percentage of the population, and I'll get to that in just a moment, that does, if we take care of those people, that does eliminate the great majority of ICU admissions. So this is your 59, and the, the, the light gray here, this is your 59 and under. And again, you're not getting a vertical curve there with those age groups. It's just not happening. So that's where I wanna just go over to this photo here, which is 
a uh, comparison of the percentage of I total ICU admissions by age relative to the percentage of the population. And so this is Toronto because uh, we don't have this, we're not able to plot the same data for all of Ontario. We do have it for Toronto. Uh, and it, it, it's a good enough proxy. It's, you know, 3 million people. So uh, at the bottom here is the ages. The blue bar is the percentage of these age groups uh, makeup of the whole population. So 20% of the population in Toronto is under 19. 5% uh, of the population is 80 plus. The gray bar is the percentage that that age group represents of all ICU admissions. So you can just tell by looking at this very quickly that 21% of the population, 60s, 70s, 80s, uh, 60 and above, uh, 10, 6, and 5% represents the great majority of ICU uh, cases. So 30%, 23%, and 18. So, you know, roughly roughly 60% of, uh, of the ICUs. So uh, have I got that right? Uh, my quick math, 65%. I can't do quick math, sorry, but anyway, you get the point. It's the greatest major, the great majority of uh, of ICUs uh, uh, admissions, and so this has implications for what uh, Mr. Brown of uh, the OST, the Ontario Science Table, said today, and um, it also has implications for our vaccine policy. So, really, we're talking about major, major reductions in ICU admissions when we when we are able to protect you know these vulnerable groups but we're talking vaccinating 11 percent of the population we this, this this should be you know something we're able to do quite soon it will depend on vaccine supply and the point being is with these amounts of reductions if the whole idea is to not have strain on the system you know we should be able to open our province and get things back to normal quite quickly uh given given these ratios the last thing that I wanted to talk about, I'm going to go back up to the first slide here. The last thing I wanted to talk about was, um, well, two things. Uh, one is aggressive vaccination and sticking with stay at home order will help avoid third wave and a third lockdown. So essentially what they've done, I'm just going to come down here, find the slides. You know, essentially what they've done is they've said, well, this is their, and this is talking about variants. So as the non variance of concern line comes down this line here and the variance of concern increase we still get a net total increase in cases and to me i just simply don't see the evidence for this so uh we remain at the mercy of what could happen and you know so just take a just take this statement here. If public health measures are lifted, cases could rise dramatically depending on the spread of B117. 117. They could rise. So we're sort of left to stay at home, keep our economies closed, and trust that, well, we're doing the right thing because it could happen. So the, and then the last point that I'll make on this presentation is just, this is really the first time that I've seen the Ontario Science Table acknowledge uh, the, the collateral harms of lockdown uh, by saying some key mental health indicators are unchanged. However, important measures such as emergency department admissions, opioid deaths, and care for eating disorders are worsening. So there is some admission that there are collateral harms, but almost a hedging of a bet or hedging of the statement saying that some, however, are unchanged. And frankly, what I thought was somewhat laughable uh, was uh, this slide, which uh, as Steiny was, Steiny Brown was uh, talking about on the, of the science table was talking about mental health impacts. He pulled up this slide, mental health medication dispensing has been stable 
as if this is, <laughs> I think he admitted this wasn't the only indicator, but you know, putting it in a, in a slide deck like this as the only indicator, uh, I think is a little insensitive uh, to a lot of the struggles that are happening out there um, to just use um, uh, uh, prescriptions to, uh, to measure that, I think is, is quite insensitive and an abdication of the collateral harms that, that the lockdowns have caused. So, so that's, that's, that's all I wanted to talk about on the, the modeling table, uh, slides today. And I just wanted to finish off by talking about something that I posted on Twitter today. Uh, which is this uh, tweet here. Uh, and essentially, you know, what I continue to point out is the age stratified risk of mortality does not get talked about enough. And it's very sad that some of the rates in older ages are higher, but you can see that the great majority of society uh, who are bearing the brunt of lockdown, of, of, of lost livelihoods, of, of stress, of reduction in elimination of culture, uh, things for people to look forward to. He, he, the, those people are, are really at extremely low risks of, of a bad outcome from COVID and are bearing a huge brunt for, um, for a group um, that, that is a small group where mortality is higher. And we have just not managed that well. We have uh, only locked, used lockdown as our tool. And um, you know, age stratified case fatality rates are not talked about enough. And it, and it goes to the school opening issue. And it's why I've talked about this so much is that there's so much debate about whether schools are, are safe and that they must open safely. Well, in my view, when you have a 0.003% case fatality rate in young kids, I mean, your answer is that school is safe that's what that tells me. It's safe for young kids. And then, you know, let's just look at some of the teacher teaching age cohorts and parent cohorts. Is it safe for them at home when their kids come home if they're infected? Well, some of these case fatality rates, you know, 59 and below. I mean, yes, the answer is they're safe. These are, these are in line with other respiratory pathogens, no worse. And so there's your answer, whether schools are closed. And it's just so much different than the narrative that we hear. And that's why I keep talking about, about these case fatality rates by age, because it just can't get talked about enough because it doesn't get talked about. And really, I mean, you could have creative solutions. There's nothing wrong with creative solutions where if you're a teacher and maybe you're, um, you're, you're, uh, you have a comorbidity or you, you know you just don't feel like your immune system's functioning well, or you're just, you know, you're just a, a little bit afraid. There's nothing wrong with that. The, the narrative has made a lot of people afraid. Well, if you're in one of these slightly higher risk groups, you know, let's find ways for those teachers to stay at home and do things like mark, marking or, you know, contribute in other ways. Uh, and let's let the younger people go and teach and the younger people go and learn because um, that's really where our future resides is, is, is there. And to have things shut down and even frankly, to have a debate over these kinds of fatality rates in school age kids and parents. Well, it's, it's, it's tough. So that's it for tonight. Uh, thank you. I hope to post some more of these. And um, as always, you know, my DMs are open. Thank you for following along at Rubicon Capital underscore uh, on Twitter. Uh, and uh, thanks for, for watching. Bye-bye.